Good afternoon, everybody. How's everything going today? This is Peggy Hoffman um, talking, and I want to get us opened up and started. Love seeing all the folks come in on the line as I see the participants um, uh, clicking in and uh, buzzing in and, and picking up uh, and joining us. And great to see some folks on the chat box. Um, look forward to having an active um, conversation today between now and one o'clock. Um, so delighted to see everybody able to, to join us. So today um, we are going to talk about taking a trickle trickle up approach to member programs. So you know we know that as national organizations we really want to give our chapters the tools and the programs that will allow them to meet members needs but yet at the same time we know that our chapters are amazingly different and diverse, right? So the question is, is there another way besides simply coming up with a great idea here and launching it to the chapters? Well, we had some very cool conversations with three of your peers um, over the last, I'd say, six to eight weeks. Um, we talked with um, NAIOP, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association, and I see that we've got some folks here from them. We talked to the Project Management Institute. I just got a chance to spend some time in Boston with a bunch of their volunteer leaders. That was fun. And the Education Theater Association to find out that there is another way. You don't always have to go national to local. You can actually trickle up, and that's what we want to talk about today um, in our conversation with you all. So. Just so for those of you that are new and joining us maybe for the first time, I want you to see the faces of the folks that are behind this, Bill Highway and Mariner. You can read all the poobah about us, but listen, I really just want you to know that Bill Highway and Mariner, um, we get chapters, we love chapters, and we view it as our great opportunity as being able to help you um, really leverage and support your chapters in some awesome ways. Um, so I'd like to find out a little bit from you all um, in terms of what's going on in your mind as you think about trickle-up approach to local programming. So let's launch a poll. Just tell me, have you used the trickle-up approach taking a local program and expanding it nationally? Maybe you say yes, and if so, I definitely want you chatting in the, sharing in the chat box. Maybe you say sort of, okay, well, you know, tell us a little bit more. Not yet, but have an idea what it is. Well, you can also tell us in the chat. Um, not yet, and you just want to leave it at that, that's great. So go ahead, click on which one of those um, responses fits you today. Uh, yes, sort of, not yet, and not yet. And let's see if we can change some of those answers maybe as we go through. Um, Sarah, you let me know when we've got a, a good group of answers there, and go ahead and uh, close that out, and we will take it from there. All righty, what do we got, uh, Sarah, in terms of folks, a lot of people saying um, yes. Oh, most people saying not yet. Oh, I was kind of hoping we'd have a whole bunch of people saying yes and scrambling to tell us their success stories. Well, that's okay. That's why we're here to have this conversation. So let's dive into it right now. Okay, so this is what our agenda is going to be. We're going to first by start talking about what are the key questions that you ought to be asking yourself if you're making this um, strategy uh, part of your portfolio. Then we're going to talk about you know, why it's important. We're going to come up with those three case studies that we have, and we're going to finish up by just giving you some takeaways. What do you do next? Let's start with those key questions. So, as I mentioned to you, we had these great conversations with three of your peers, and they gave us some insight about the process that they went through in making some decisions. And they also kind of reminded us that it's going to be a lift, but there's some good reasons because there's a, there's a lot of value to taking the risk in engaging our members in this way. The first question they say is really important is, is there a wider need for this program? And you're going to hear, um, particularly from our first case study, about how something that started was plugging in locally, was plugging in to what the national surveys were saying, which helped verify for them, in fact, there was a wider need. And part of that is, will the chapters be open to participate? Now, if there's a, if there's a, if there's a demonstrable need, we're sure you can get that, but maybe sometimes it's a matter about educating or informing, and that will come out in our case studies as well. The second is, what is your role going to be? What I love about these case studies 
is that they took three different roles. One was a heavy lift in terms of really helping to recraft the program and resource it. One was simply being the connecting point. So whether you're whether you have a large chapter management staff and a large membership or everything is small, there's probably a way you can still use the trickle up approach. And of course, the third question that you have to ask yourself, and you're going to ask this before you get started, is how am I going to measure success? Because if you're going to put resources and time into it, you better know how you're going to know if, in fact, it was successful. Really cool, because all three of these case studies decide their success metrics, and they can actually report having met those. So as I said, it's a lift. And your peers gave us a couple of um, good, good reasons incentives actually for why we should go ahead and put our roll up our sleeves and put the energy to this. So the first thing is um, is really that oftentimes you'll be sitting at the national level, right? And you've got a program and you've got this awesome idea and you want to push it down. And it's not necessarily going to fit everybody. But if you've got this program that's running at the local level, you know it's successful. And when you know that it's successful, you can begin to say, let's see if we can make this work for all of us. And that's where you get an opportunity to look at scaling the work at a local chapter across the system. It allows you to begin to, rather than taking this one size fits all and push it down, it allows you to take something and then work it through the system. Now, I love when we were talking, one of the folks said, you know, it's kind of a little bit like recipe scaling. Yes. You just don't double. You have to realize that every ingredient is a little bit different, as are your chapters. But when you take a program that has worked for one chapter, you're able to adapt it based on the, the idiosyncrasies, the differences in those chapters. Now, it does make sense for you to understand that while it won't automatically work for all those chapters, Following a few steps will, in fact, allow you to take a program that you know has got capacity, you know has got the, um, the ability to be successful. You're going to be able to take that program and, uh, and bring it to other organizations. The first thing to do is to identify the program, which, of course, is the easy part, and then deciding if you're going to be the driver or the facilitator. So let's stop talking about the, uh, the theory, and let's talk a little bit about the practice how three associations actually went about making this work. Okay, I want to start with um, NIOP, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association, and their mentoring program. No, wait a minute. I should not call it their mentoring program because that's part of the story here. You see, their Toronto chapter, which happens to be a bit unique, yes, their second largest chapter, they have a lot of members, um, they're the ones that actually began it. Now, what you might want to know about that NAOP, and let me give you a little bit of stats about the background. They've got 51 chapters. They've got about 19,000 members. Um, their chapters are independent, operating under an affiliation agreement. But the Toronto chapter, because they've got some very large ones, like the Toronto, some very small ones, had some resources. And they actually, using um, a, um, a software platform, they created a mentoring model. And it really helped them drive chapter engagement. And this could be a very large, almost daunting chapter. The software, in essence, to simply match the mentors and the mentees. Here's the interesting thing. They were so successful in Toronto that Courtney, who was then there, walked around and was telling all the other chapters about this. And the other chapters got excited. Remember we said, you got to know, is this important? And you got to know, are the chapters going to be interested? Well, chapters were. And they're like, how do we do this? How can we replicate this? And that's where NAOP had to come to question number two. What is going to be our role? I mean, what can we do in terms of translating this very successful program in Toronto to a nationally offered program? And... They are an example of an organization that decided to take the big investment. What they decided to do was to take the Toronto program and be able to refashion it in a way that would work for their other chapters, whether they were large or small, regardless of the number of members, and make it available at no cost. They started by going to the Toronto chapter and saying, okay, 
let's have a one-year licensing agreement and we'll be able to hire some software engineers and we'll put this together. So they paid for the software, they provided the templates, they provided all the to-dos and all the needs and for the mentors and the mentees, then they did a really smart thing. Because you know, one of the questions that they ask is, what is the value of this? And the value of this really is about chapter engagement. So they created a national dashboard that helps them track um, what's going on with the individual chapters, be able to spotlight things where they might be able to smooth out, might be able to provide additional assistance, maybe they can tweak it. How can they make sure, how can they track their, their record, make sure that they were achieving success? Now, Again, remember we said at the very beginning, you're going to have to recognize you just don't double set something, right? The recipe just doesn't double up. You have to take a look at the what's needed at the local level. So they created this wonderful thing, and they, they, they created all the nuances for the large and the small, but then they went to the locals, and they helped them customize the program for them. They helped them understand what is the the members in your area specifically need? Um, and how are you gonna operate this in your area that's gonna make it, well, successful and meet the needs? And they also, of course, made sure there's a post program survey. Okay, so then we get to the rollout. What I think is really interesting about the rollout here is that you've got a couple of, 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 of important lessons that all of us need to know. The first is that when you put this together, Realize that our volunteer leaders are very busy. Make sure you're offering training that makes a difference. And they do it in both ways. So they did hosted webinars, but they also did one-on-one -on -one with their chapter executives where they had chapter executives. So they did the, the, you know, the one-to-many and the one-to-one. -one. And of course, everything was recorded, so it also became what was available on your time. They, did, they went to local chapter board meetings, and their success is they have 14 using it. So let's talk about their key takeaways, because this is where you can take a program. If you're smaller, you might say, wow, I don't have that much money to put to this, or I don't have a huge chapter that's, that's creating a software-based program. So let's look at the key takeaways. How can I adapt this to my own organization? So the first message that NAOP will give you, and you're gonna hear this in the other case studies, is remember that this is a collaboration, okay? Remember to give credit where credit is due. And one of the really cool um, outgrowths of this is that the chapters see you as a partner and they're more willing to bring their projects to you. Secondly, you really have to know what your chapters want. And it begins by knowing what do the members want? So part of what made this whole thing come together was a survey that they had done with developing leaders, those under 35 years, who said we want mentoring and career advice. When they saw that a local chapter was doing this, was, was, was really acting on this survey finding, they went to all of the other chapters and they really found out how this would work more effectively. And one of their ahas in, the, in this, and this is the reason why you should go to the chapters before you try to scale it, but they found that a one-year commitment was gonna be way too much for many of the volunteers, and so they scaled it to a slightly smaller group, um, which of course offered the flexibility. The third key takeaway was communication. So communicate, communicate, and then communicate again. What I loved about their program when we were learning about it was how they had baked communication in on every stage, and that allowed them to really understand if the program wasn't working, how they could how they could maybe help it also allowed them to know where to help in a way that made it didn't mean that they were taking it over but they were actually coaching and mentoring their chapter leaders it also helped them to understand that it's not going to fit for everybody so maybe the whole program wouldn't fit for a chapter maybe there was elements of it how could they help them still do say for example mentoring even if they weren't going to use the software-based mentoring that communication loop meant the chapters, even those that weren't going to opt in, still felt the love and the commitment. So at the end of the day, there was a program that made a tremendous difference for, for their members and their chapter leaders. I'm seeing some questions coming in, so let me give a quick pause as I take a look at this. How the mentoring program fits in the strategic plan and mission for, and oh, Lynn, thanks for asking that question. 
Because when we talk about what should the role be, part of what you're going to do is scale that role um, based on how that, in fact, fits within the strategic plan and the mission vision for NAOP. Now, I can't speak to NAOP's um, mission vision, and if there is someone on the, on the phone from here, maybe on the chat, excuse me, maybe they can add a little bit more about this. But, we'll, but what I will tell you is that, is that their survey said that in order for them to be able to increase engagement of this, these developing leaders, and to be able to assure retention of this cohort, that they needed to address the mentoring and the career advice needs of this group. So from a perspective of meeting the members' needs where they are as being part of what drives NAOP's decisions around its programming, it was a win-win. It made a complete connection there. Okay, let's see. You said that um, chapter leaders periodically have highlighted certain. Yes, excellent. Thank you, uh, Claire Aston from the Association for Corporate Growth, saying that we've seen chapters adapt programs that have certain chapter initiatives, and that is really a cool way of 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 creating that scalability. Right, Cr put an initiative out there and then ask folks who wants to do it. Let them opt in. Um, Aaron, you're asking about the time frame from Toronto's, Toronto's excuse me, establishing the program, the adoption of the 14 chapters. You know, I am not certain about that, so I'm going to have to see if we can get somebody from NAOP to give you that answer, but that certainly is a very important question in terms of what was the length of time here. So let's see if we can't go ahead and get that for you. And meanwhile, I'd like to take us talk us take us, excuse me, to our next um, example, which comes from the Project Military, excuse me, the Project Management Institute. Um, so um, let me grab some water here, as I want to talk a little bit about this next program, which is completely different um, in many ways from the NAOP story. So, I will say that for those of you who know the Project Management Institute, um, they're a large organization, obviously. Um, they've got local, regional um, uh, components. They, they, the number of chapters, they roll up into regions. They connect with national. They're, there is a membership handshake. They've got about 300 um, global chapters, about 162 in North America. They have about 500,000 individuals. Um, so they're, they're large scale. But this is an example of what can start as a very small idea, very small program, and how it can scale up based on simply being able to, um, to take a look at a program that, was, uh, that met the members' needs in a very real and passionate way. So it's their military program. So let me give you a little bit of, uh, a little bit of details about it. It's called Operation Qualify for Hire. Um, it comes out of PMI's, um, uh, uh, I'm going to call it their global commitment to the communities that they serve and understanding that helping the military transition from military life to civilian life is, is part of what all communities should be able to do. And their goal was really to be able to aid veterans, their active military, and their families in this transition. Um, it came comes from a place where um, they understand that a huge part of transition is being able to secure employment and that um, project management is often a really good fit for that military mindset, right? It's, um, it's, it's often a, um, a, a career trajectory that military are very successful in it, veterans are very successful in it. Now, as I said, this started very, very small, so think two volunteers in their Tampa, Florida chapter. One was um, a certified project manager from DOD, and the other was a retired uh, lieutenant colonel from the Army who, after transitioning, had discovered <laughs> project management, understanding, again, it was a perfect fit from the military mindset, got certified and said, wow, this is a career path that I want to share. So they began simply with monthly educational um, lunch and learn um, sessions. And um, it was just really small, informal. They were held on um, one of the um, Air Force bases, and they were conversations that helped folks take a look at project management and then prepare for the certification. Well, 
of course, um, like wildfire, great ideas spread. And in this particular case, it spread beautifully to um, a regional, um, the, to the region, because as I said, um, PMI chapters are focused in these really wonderful regions that do a lot of, of, of cross collaboration. And coming out of the Florida in that region, there are a number, as you can imagine, um, uh, military bases and installations. And so they really have the opportunity to grow this, um, to grow this regionally and again continue to support it and, and vet it before it went nationally. So it went from that, and what was really neat from that regional program, one of the ahas was a new chapter role. It was the military liaison. So this is um, typically for members who are either currently in or formerly in the military. This is really great because you see how this program not only was meeting the needs of this community give back, meeting the needs of an emerging membership um, cohort, right? But it was also developing a really cool volunteer position. Now understand, remember we said started with two volunteers. When you see a volunteer doing something and it's making a difference and they get passionate about it and you can act on that by creating a volunteer role that can be replicated, that's kind of like, um, I don't know, an inside win, <laughs> if you will. Um, they naturally realized that because this program had the capacity to be both the give back, right, but also a membership growth perspective and a certification growth perspective, they naturally looked at social media and developed a LinkedIn group that other chapters could join, folks could join, and they could begin to share the successes and build the buzz around this very important program. As they did all of this, of course, they naturally began to create the military cookbook, right? It includes all the materials, it includes stories, it includes um, tools and, and, and recommendations and ideas. And of course, putting all that together now between the Facebook, excuse me, the LinkedIn group, the handbook, this um, new role, they were able to take it nationally. Now, the cool thing is, it's still really a locally um, implemented, locally nurtured program, but it has become um, a real uh, rallying point for PMI. So I love to look at the results because they've got numbers that are pretty darn impressive. So they rolled it out to um, I think it was about um, um, 140 or so chapters, 51% of whom are participating, 10,000 service members, um, veterans and active military have been touched by this. 60% um, um, have, have become members, 40% are certificate holders. And it's all because they started, they have created the handbook, they have the webinars, they have the communications, and they have sharing. Pretty impressive results when you begin to look at how a program started by two volunteers could be scaled to have that great of an outreach. So what are their key takeaways? And again, what I love about um, talking to folks is this whole idea of beginning to hear the themes that help us take any of these ideas and adapt them to their own. So they refer to it as being inclusive. Same kind of idea as, um, as NAOPS, you know, make it a collaboration or a partnership, right? Involves the people who started the program. These two um, beginning um, volunteers have become some of the biggest champions. That region has become a big champion. As I mentioned at the beginning, I was up in Boston with uh, Region 3, um, which is a, the cohort that is um, the eastern part of, eastern side of, Cal of, 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 of excuse me, Canada down into the um, New England states. They were talking about this. So this being inclusive and keeping the people involved and engaged really allows you to develop this champion and allows you also to um, have people begin to feel that ownership. And recognizing the leaders, um, I think that the really cool thing when I was there in Boston, you know, I got to, I got to see this firsthand, but I'm in Boston and they're talking about it and they're, they're naming these two people. And, oh yeah, so-and-so from Tampa. It was like, it was like people go, oh man, and they embraced it and they honored those leaders and the next set of leaders that are going to carry this program forward felt that honoring and, and, and really are remaining committed to the program. And of course, an open communications channel 
Um, lots of conversation around this, lots of sharing. It was really neat. Um, they did use the chapter rollouts as informal focus groups um, that allowed them to sort of tweak some things. So um, I know one of the things that they talked about was going out to a, a, a number of them first who they knew that they could begin to work through some of the, you know, the, the bumps, if you will. So a great um, takeaway there is to let those early adopters um, really be part of helping um, co-create the program as it moves forward. Um, I worked with, I don't know how many of you know Maddie Grant. Uh, I'll never forget something that she said to me years ago when she was talking about a program that she described it as um, forever beta. And I think that one of the neat things about the NAOP program and the PMI story really um, get to that idea of allowing the program to be tweaked and enhanced and, and to grow over time when you get that local ownership. And that's a real example here with PMI. When you get that local ownership, you're able to do that continuous um, improvement. Let's see if we've got some other questions. Uh, Jill says, we invite these people to present at our chapter leader training workshop. Great. So Jill, what you're saying is when you have, um, when you have folks involved and engaged, you bring them to the chapter leader program so they can promulgate their own successes and to share and then to be sort of the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Love that idea, Jill. That's a great way of taking folks that are, that are um, really um, connected to let them plug in again. Diana, thanks you for for jumping in on NAOP's mentorship program, saying that it does fit um, right into the um, um, the talent development initiative and the strategic plan. Um, that you know, that was a great question that was asked. Um, I think it was um, Lynn who asked that question. A great question to ask, Lynn. And I think that that's what allows you and allowed NAOP to be able to put the ROI. The you know put the resources because they could prove the ROI in that connection. Um, great, co listen guys, keep the chat going. Um, let's, you know, let's evolve all of these ideas and find a way to make them, to make them our own because they won't fit um, necessarily uh, right over, right? Okay, here's a quiz for you guys. Tom Hanks and Madonna, what do they have in common? Think about this for a moment. Tom Hanks and Madonna. Give up? Well, the answer is sort of on your screen. You see, they were both part of the 2.3 million people inducted into the Educational Theater Association. Um, and I would dare say are probably in some way involved in our next case study, but they're certainly involved in the Educational Theater Association. So um, this particular uh, case study begins in Texas um, after Hurricane um, Harvey. Um, the goal from uh, in Texas was to get from Texas schools for Texas schools. So the idea here is Hurricane Harvey hit a big swath, but Texas is an even bigger state, and they wanted to find a way to connect the schools that that didn't get that didn't get hit that had um, resources, get them involved and engaged in helping those that didn't. And so national took that program and said, if it can work in Texas, surely it's going to be able to work for other states. So let me pause and tell you a little bit about what the state, what the national office was thinking about when they said this. You see, they have 47 states, um, state organizations, as well as two international. Um, they have also have um, thespian troops um, uh, world, uh, around the world, about 100,000 active junior and high school thespians, right? And about 5,000 professionals. Um, as I mentioned, they've got like well over 2 million folks that have been inducted into the program. And so they had a lot of, of the next generation excited, engaged, and connected in their organization. Um, and so this was a real opportunity to take something from a Texas chapter where they were able to see this incredible outpouring by these students, by this next generation that wanted to engage, involved, and truthfully connect um, in a way that was meaningful to get them, um, get them really engaged in the organization and take that model and blow it up so that it could go nationally. So it, in essence, the program is going to match schools who need help with schools who want help. So. 
Of course, Harvey was just unfortunately the beginning. Um, from there, we had um, Hurricane Irma. We have Hurricane Maria. And all along, we have the West Coast, Northern Cal area burning. So they said, all right. We see so many, uh, so so much success in this program that started with the Google Doc and just you know connecting school to school. Let's see if we can't facilitate it. Now here's where it's really different, I think, from NAOP and a bit different from PMI in that they didn't want to be the bank. Um, they didn't want to collect funds and distribute it. They didn't want to get involved in the processes. Um, what they really wanted to do was to help the chapters. Um, connect so they could get the fund where it needed to go. So no middleman, no third party here. Um, and they didn't also didn't want to get in this whole idea of I have to vet these people, right? It's like a school says they need help, a school wants to help, let's pull them together. So what they essentially did was say, what Texas did, we're going to do nationally. Now, when I say they're going to do it nationally, they scaled it and expanded it. It still is a local program. What's cool about this is that there'll always be a need, and by using the Higher Logic platform, they were able to just put the right technology, overlay it on the need to make it work. Um, they, of course, use social, mes and that, that social media, hashtag Thespians Helping Thespians. Um, what's really neat, and this is, the pe this is the point, if I could highlight this and circle it, I would, um, there's no management here right? Um, when you have an online community uh, and it's there and you're managing that 24 by 7, you're putting this on the website and you're allowing it to live, to be tapped when it needs to be tapped. There's no, they, they're not doing the banking. They're not doing the vetting. They're simply saying we can bring, we can be the core. We can be the, the place where um, all the connections are made, then you guys go and make it happen. The inside win on this is they now have created a really cool driver to get them to that community where people can see all the other things that are happening, right? So the inside win for this is you are taking a platform that is a portal to all the things you offer, you're making it a go-to place really, really cool. So let's talk about the results. They have 170, uh, 174 um, schools. Hang on one second, folks. Sorry. 174 schools have pledged. They've got 22 schools identified as needing help. They managed to get their local businesses involved who pledged help. So now you see the students allowing the, their communities to get involved and engaged. Key takeaways. These are going to sound really familiar, guys. Again, collaborate, collaborate, and collaborate. So they kept open discussions, uh, conversation, dialogue. Let's use the word dialogue here between the Texas chapter and national. What's working? How's it going? How do we adapt it? Um, oh, as things tweaked, as, as Texas learned things, national learned things, and shared it after the other states, it really created this, again, this win-win level of, of trust and inclusive. And then as other schools came on, you just blew out that cooperation to a, a larger group of people. What's really neat about this is, let's go back to those first set of questions. What role can we do? Remember that's question number two. What role can we realistically play in this? And they said, you know, we don't have the bandwidth to be the bank. You know, we can only do so much, but we can enable those connections, right? We can do that peer-to-peer -peer connection. We can get a chapter leader over here talking to a chapter leader over here, which is bringing together um, that conversation in a way that then makes it even have an even broader reach. And of course, the shine from national is that you're meeting members' needs by empowering your chapters. All right, guys. Let's see what questions you've got. I'd love to see what some of the chat's going on here. Um, anything else? So we've got a couple of conversations going on here. Um, 
Yes, taking the community service focus as a local initiative. Um, now, one person has said, mentions, this is Becky, she was saying, they started as a local initiative, but they had lukewarm participation and acceptance. I mean, I think, how many times are we going to run into that kind of stuff? I think, I think that is probably um, the secret sauce in all three of these was finding something that um, was was addressing a pain point or a really critical need. So if you look at if you look at the um, NAOP, so everybody wants to figure out how to get the next gen involved, um, and they had really good um, uh, research saying that this is what folks wanted, and they had a turnkey solution that they could provide. Now remember, they have 14 chapters out of 51 that are doing it, and the launch in Charlotte, North Carolina is pretty fresh. Um, but the excitement around it has been an indicator that it will probably go places. But understand the pain point is, how do we connect with this next generation? When you look at PMI, um, in those territories, in those areas where there is a, a connection to military, this was, a, this was a true commitment to giving back and a real sense of how is this going to make a difference at the local level. And then when you look at this last one, I mean, there was so much of galvanizing. This is a major disaster. We have to help each other. So maybe if it hasn't worked for you yet, it's about going back to the board and saying, okay, let's see if there is a pain point that we can really latch on to. And again, not every chapter is going to do this. But when you engage all the chapters in the conversation, if they choose not to opt in, they still hear your message that they're important, that you want to be part of, of being a help and support for them, and that when a chapter has something that's working, you believe and you trust in them. So sometimes even if it doesn't get every, every, the full traction you want, Maybe the win-win is building a stronger collaborative mindset in your chapters. Um, and you know what I love about this? Um, oh, yes, Lynn. Thank you. I'm just saying, Lynn, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit AD, ADHD, and I love to I start something, and then I look and I go, whoops, squirrel. Um, I know. Um, Lynn, isn't that so true? A way to support the schools without committing national. You know, it, that's, that's, and, and, and what, what really tugged at my heart, Lynn, just to get a little bit further, is that they engage students who are clearly going to be members and engaged in this organization. But you know how we always lose that student connection at some point? So it's really cool that those kids will remember it and their parents will remember it. I mean, I just thought it was, a, you know, an inside win. So um, anyway, you know what? Um, I wanted to mention this, is that before we go into turn ideas into actions, so we happened to have um, an organization reach out to us, and I'm going to forgive me, I believe it was uh, NAOP in conversation with NAOP, we heard about this program. That's how we come up with um, ideas for these webinars, is when you tell us what topics and stories you either have something to share, like it's been a win for you, or you have, you're trying to figure something out and you would like to see us um, cover it. So the, the conversation around speakers, um, directories, oh my gosh, that came from you all. Um, this idea of having something that's a real win and let's share it broader to the community, there's another example. So while we're finishing up here, I don't want to miss the opportunity to ask you in the chat box to tell us, is there topics or stories you'd like to hear more about? Um, the other thing is, I've seen a couple of questions, um, more specific questions for some of these folks. Uh, any questions that we can't answer, we'll see if we can't get out to our contacts who were so generous in their time and talking to us so we can get some clarity. So stay tuned. If we can't answer your question, um, as I said, we'll go ahead and, and, um, and get some answers for you. All right. So, you know, part of us always asking someone when they tell us the story, the key takeaways is because at the end of the day, you can give us your, let me see, how are we? We're going to give us, we're, you're going to give us about your hour today, right? Um, if you can't take this and act on it, um, is the hour worth it? And so part of what we always do with our folks is figure out what are the, how do I turn the ideas into actions? And we take those key takeaways and we take the stories and we figure that out. 
So if you want to start this, one of the coolest things to do is to brainstorm with your chapters. Now, um, Jill mentioned that, you know, she gets stories. Um, she gets people to present at the Chapter Leaders Conference, which is a truly a, a great, a, a great um, example. And probably most of you do it. Do you go to the next step, though? So after someone has done a presentation, do you do maybe a quick, um, hey, let's go to the Chapter Hive, you know, a little networking area. Anybody who's interested in this, let's have a deeper conversation about what it might mean to take this, take this broader. Um, do you ever take an idea like that and ask somebody in a quick survey to your chapters, hey, chapters, um, who's interested in this? And if you're interested in, who's willing to get on the webinar and talk through some ideas? So when you have a great idea, how can you take it the next step, step by simply asking folks to um, brainstorm around it? Maybe it'll go nowhere, but it'll certainly be a good conversation. Uh, I love it. Jill's already doing that. This is what I love um, is that uh, is that we we all have different ways of doing it. The way she's doing it is table topics, so they can talk further about what they've learned. I love that idea. Thanks, 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 thanks. Um, so the second one is um, pick a program and showcase it at the national level. So that's exactly what NAOP did, and that's what Jill does at her at her particular workshops. And then ask for the feedback, gauge interest from the chapters. So um, whether you're taking an existing program, or excuse me, an existing story and asking it, or going a little bit more broadly. Then when you have found something, um, thanks to the question that we got, I think it was from Beth about this connection, take a look at your strategic plan, take a look at um, your program plan for the year, and ask yourselves, is, does this fit in somewhere? And if it does, does it fit in in a way that we should be driver or we should be facilitator? Um, or, and, and maybe in answering that question, you say, uh, if we're driver, it's more likely to get the resources it needs to be successful. Or, you know, this is a low resource thing, for example, the wonderful thing about the disaster relief. We, we only need to be a facilitator. So have that question around, you know, what's going to make this, this successful and how does this really connect into our organization, our plan, our program of work, our priorities, and then roll it out. Now, what I loved about in all, in two of the three cases, uh, really the, the PMI and the, and the, and the NAOP, they did, um, they didn't call them this, but they did it, in essence what I would call a soft rollout. So, it, and they, they live by that, as I mentioned earlier, that forever beta. So they rolled it out in a way that allowed them to learn from the process and to get some testing into it and to find out, is this really going to work? Um, there's, you don't have to go from Texas nationwide, right? You can do like they did at PMI, Florida, region, larger region, a little bit across the country. Um, or, as NAOP did, looking at those chapters that had a high interest and, and, a, and, a, and, and were really had a commitment to it and working through the process with them. And they've got one chapter launching at this point so they can really learn from it. So there are lots of, of, of ideas out there, lots of ways that you could, that, that you could turn these ideas into actions. I'd love to see your questions. What's going to keep you from doing this? What's going to allow you to do this? Um, so let's have a little bit of a conversation right now with your questions. So I got, I got Claire saying, what are some ways people showcase their local programs? She asks, because we have a periodic conference call from best practice, and there's a low turnout. Um, Claire, you are suffering from what all of us are suffering from, is that our chapter leaders say, I totally want to hear more, and then they have day jobs and they can't come to those calls. So I'm sure some of you have some really great ideas. How are you getting people to showcase local programs? Um, besides this idea of a conference call people might, might not be able to come on to, besides um, you know, showcasing it at your national leadership conference, are there other ways that you are helping folks um, showcase local programs. Um, while people are madly typing in, and I'm going to assume that they are madly typing in, I can share two things that I've heard. 
um, at a national conference for one organization. They have, um, you know how you have a poster session for students? Well, they have a poster session for chapters, and um, the chapters put on display in an area, something that they're really proud of. Um, and they're asked to give out, um, um, you know, samples or whatever, and it's in a room for chapter leaders or, or people engaged with the chapters. So it's at the national conference. So it's just taking the conversation and planting it where there might be other members there. So um, certainly that's one that I've heard about. And then um, another uh, one that I've heard at, and I just saw Jill um, jump in, and quite frankly, this is very similar to Jill. She just says they have a best practices document exchange online. Um, and I, in, in, in following up on that, one of the things that another organization does, uh, they have a chapter leader e-letter, and they highlight a chapter success in that e-letter. And they always give the contact information to talk to the chapter uh, more closely if they want to. So I think that's another way of doing it, putting it, uh, just having that, um, that, that best practices document exchange online is really nice. Um, so I, um, Kylie is sharing that they have a program that incentivizes best practice sharing by submitting chapters are eligible for national recognition and financial rewards. Totally love the carrot approach. <laughs> People are more than interesting to more than interested, excuse me, in um, sharing when they when they frankly when they when they know that uh, there's something at the other end. So I'd be interested, in, Kylie. Maybe you can chat a little bit more about that um, in terms of, you know, um, when you've done that, um, do you get a lot of chapters um, submitting? And have any of those programs have you taken them nationally? <laughs> Um, Sarah, great idea. We've taken chapter programs um, that target two underserved member groups and rolled out how-to um, toolboxes for other chapters. You know, the how-to toolboxes is one of the easiest ways to do it. Um, I, you know, I manage three chapters here at Mariner, um, Public Relations Society of, Amer of America's Maryland chapter, the Appraisal Institute's DC Metro chapter, and the Maryland Recycling Network. And one of the coolest things that we get from two of those nationals, occasionally more from PRSA perhaps than the others, but we'll get a, um, you know, we'll get a, you know, a, a, a program in a, in a program in a box. We'll get a here's a social media um, um, campaign around X in a box. Um, t really giving us tools and helping us show how to take something and implement in our own area is great. And I like what you've done, Sarah, when you say that you've taken that energy, because it takes time to put those together, and you've targeted on some underserved areas, which means you're really helping open up the minds of your chapter leaders to think about some programs outside maybe their their um, their comfort zone. So that's really cool. And Jessica mentions they have a chapter success story series. I love that. Oh. Wait a minute, Jessica also says they share stories with the national board. You know, that is a great way. I mean, give that shout out at a national level is another way of creating that, that trust and that partnership with your chapter organizations. Very cool. Keep, you know, keep giving us some ideas because I think that that's, if you get the right, um, you, get, you get the right program, the right idea, uh, there's just so many inside wins in all of these programs. I mean, you know, NAOP won by, um, won by being able to reach an audience with a very specific um, response to something that they asked for. Um, they're able to, they're going to be able to track and see increased engagement and retention in that group. That's, that's, that's a win. Um, you know, the um, Educational Theater Association was able to engage a generation that they might lose once they graduate, but they're going to have that indelible stamp in them. So, so that's a win. And what I really loved is, um, is uh, that, that PMI has found a way to elevate PMI um, as well as a really cool way of creating a meaningful volunteer role in a time when we're looking for finding meaningful roles for volunteers, but they're going to get that passion and that, and that real satisfaction too. So lots of really cool um, inside wins for these things. Um, Connie mentions that they had 20 to 50 best practices submits each year. Oh, Kylie, we want to see that list. We somehow have a feeling it's a gold mine that we here could, <laughs> could maybe really find some triggers. Um, you know, Sarah, 
let's go ahead and just get a sense from the group here. We've had some good conversation, although I will admit I'm doing all the talking. <laughs> let's hear from you guys. How likely are you to try the trickle up approach? I mean, are you like a can't wait or yeah, thinking I might um, or I'm really on the fence. And if you're on the fence, tell us what's Tell us what's keeping you there so we can, maybe we can, you know, push you to one side or the other. Nah, but this was interesting. Hey, we get it. Um, we get it. But it might trigger something else down there, uh, something else different for you guys. So tell us, now, how likely you try the trickle-up approach? Um, and, and as I said, uh, also tell us what are the questions or what are the things that you need to know about this? You can only put so much in a 60-minute conversation, but we aim to get the community to answer the questions that haven't been answered um, with us right now. We've got about uh, nine more minutes. Um, Sarah, what's it looking like? Thinking I might. Well, good. Ah, five of you can't wait. I totally love that. Um, fair enough. Some are really on the fence. A couple are really not, but that's okay. We get it. Um, I think the really cool thing here is, is that um, um, maybe we've just reinforced some really cool concepts about engaging chapter leaders in things that drive them to help the national uh, really be um, create more value for its members. So, um, yeah, I love Lindsay. Thanks for jumping in there with a trickle out approach to become <laughs> conduit to share practices with chapters. I think maybe that should be the next one, huh? A trickle trickle out approach. Um, uh, so Rachel is asking, what is the incentive to participate? And I'm assuming um, that you mean the incentive to participate in any of these particular programs. Um, and I think that one of the incentives that we heard was the, um, you know, the option for a national award or fundraising or funds for these things. I think that the incentive for um, certainly for in the NAOP world is you're getting a pretty robust mentoring program and the training to boot. So the incentive is you get a chance to launch a new program in your chapter um, without having to do the heavy lift of the, of the design and build part for that. But if other folks see that there's incentives to participate, please um, go ahead and uh, share those now. Um, and we've still got the lines open, so keep, um, you know, keep putting in your questions. And while you do, I want to just do a couple of quick reminders for you. Um, CEX is coming your way um, October 26th. We are going to um, be in um, Virginia once again for the full day program. Um, I am super excited to let you know that um, we have confirmed two of our TED Talk folks. One who is a current CEO who came through the CRP and going to share how does one go from CRP to CEO? Very exciting. And another one is going to be on uh, being a change management. It's really cool. Um, we've also got, um, we're nailing down some of our, um, our tech tool um, speakers. And so we've got lots of things happening. Um, I, it's just, it's, it's a real opportunity for the community to come together. Remember, our program is crowdsourced. Go to www.leveragechapters.com. We got a survey up there for you to tell us about your tech tools and your questions so that we can make sure the content is yours. We, and when you look up there, you'll see that we've got, we've listed, we've listed buckets. We're filling in the specifics based on what you tell us you want. So this is not an approach where we bring to you the list of programs. This is where you tell us what you want. And uh, we work really darn hard to make it happen. Um, just so you know, if, you, if, um, if you're around in the Chicago Area Roundtable coming up on the 11th of July, um, chapter roundtables in D.C., Alexandria, and rest in the following week, the 17th, 18th, and 19th. By the way, great lunches at all of those. Okay, here's my own personal um, um, push for you. If you're coming to ASAE Annual, how many are coming to ASAE Annual? Say me too, me too, me too. Um, ASAE Annual, we got accepted. We, meaning the lovely um, uh, uh, Lindsay Curry from RAPS and Christina Hartle from Inns of the Court, um, Charlotte from Bill Highway and Peggy uh, got accepted. We're so excited. 
for a um, deep dive session, an hour and a half session, a component hackathon retrofit for the 21st century. So this is the way it's going to work. It is going to be, I've got, I got just a few more moments I get to tell you about this. Okay. It is going to be a session and it's for you guys, but it's a hackathon, meaning no, we're not going to sit around and just do some brainstorming or sit around and just say, this is a problem. Let's give a bunch of solutions. We are going to build design and build um, new solutions, new a new program, maybe a new process, but we're going to design and build what we need to, to be have effective chapter programs. So here's the deal. Um, we're going to work on three, three of these, and the way we're going to pick the three is based on how you guys vote. So on allyourideas.org, Component Hackathon 2018. By the way, the link is in your chat box. You can vote for the topics. And by the way, all our ideas, I ran across this. This is a free platform. It's a wiki put out by um, some educators wanting to um, empower local communities to be able to crowdsource ideas and solutions. It's a great platform. So even if you don't want to vote, go up there and take a look at it. Um, Anyway, um, uh, we want to we want to get your ideas, but we're thinking that it's possibility that one's going to be, you know, what is a pop up chapter? Okay, essentially, um, you know, how do we create a a different kind of a model for those areas that just need a chapter once in a while? Um, we might look at how do you build a better leadership um, training strategy? Um, another one that has been um, proposed is. How do we build a better chapter management tool? You know, the things that we can use to manage our chapters. Um, anyway, so um, just some really great things and you have the opportunity to go up there and do that. I want you to be in the room on August 20th. Um, it's uh, the afternoon session. I do want you to be in the room, but even if you're not gonna be in the room, you know, I still invite you to, um, to the allyourideas.org uh, place to go ahead and um, by the way, I'm getting a I'm getting a nudge uh, apparently to remind you that CE that CEX is already half sold. We do have a capacity a place where where we cannot go beyond and uh, well, guys, 50 50 55 percent of the seats are already taken. Just was supposed to mention that to you. Um, <laughs> anyway, this has been a total complete awesome um, conversation that we've been having. And I want to just let me put that back up again so you don't have a blank screen. I just want to let you know that, is, as always, it is a lot of fun to be able to talk with you guys. I know you guys have lots of things to do. We're going to let you end up with uh, giving you two minutes back down into your life. Remember, these, these are all always um, uh, recorded so you can come back and look at any of these things. Remember also, uh, yes, so Jessica, the presentation will be available offline. Um, just, um, <laughs> uh, just, uh, just know that if we didn't answer a question, it's not because we didn't want to, and we do want to. And if you send it to us either in the chat box before we pause this, or by email, um, we will be more than happy to to figure out what the answer is and get it to you. All of the ideas here in the chat box, we're going to grab and and curate for you. Anything we can do for you, a topic. Uh, something you want to talk about, anything we can do in these, we actually want to do it. So if I can tell you one last time, have an awesome day. Um, we'll be launching the next webinar date. It'll be in uh, July, and it'll be about ROI. All right, guys, have a great day. Talk to you soon.